So I, I'm a journalist, so I'm a, I'm a reporter. I'm, I'm here to learn about these ideas and uh, speak to, to people about you know, AI, but also the intersection with longevity. And, um, you know, my, my own thinking is kind of along the lines of what you've articulated, I think. Um, yeah, I think, I think it would be great if we could find a way to prolong life. I don't know about immortality, but um, I don't know if that would be preferable, desirable, but I, I definitely think that an extended lifespan would be. But then we do have to rethink our, our society and our structures and our systems to accommodate what that might mean for, you know, just a massive explosion in the number of people we've got around. But yeah, uh, my name's Q Mars, by the way. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, um, that's, um, that's probably what I should have led with. But, um, Which paper do you work for? Uh, oh, I work for Live Science, so um, I've met some of you already, uh, some of you are meeting for the yeah. first time, and um, we are a science uh, news website, uh, it's going on since 2004, I think, um, and technology is my area. So. Thank you everybody for being here, uh, I'm really happy. Uh, so let me also introduce quickly myself and then talk for about 10 minutes, maximum 15 minutes, and then we open the discussion. So, uh, as you know, I am Jose Cordeiro. I was originally born in Venezuela when Venezuela was rich and democratic. <laughs> and now I live in Spain, where, which Spain is more or less uh, wealthy and democratic. Um, I studied in the USA. I went to MIT. Actually, one of my favorite professors was Marvin Minsky, who was one of the three people who coined the expression artificial intelligence. So I have been interested in artificial intelligence since the beginning since I was at MIT. One of my other favorite uh, professors, mentors, and friends is Ray Kurzweil, who is also from MIT. And Ray Kurzweil has been promoting the idea of the singularity. Uh, he's the most common or famous person talking about the singularity, even though he did not coin the word with this meaning. It was a science fiction author, Vernon Vinge, who actually talked about the singularity from this point of view. Um, I am also one of the founding faculty of Singularity University, where I met Paul Spiegel in Silicon Valley in California. And um, Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis, both from MIT, are the founders, the big founders of Singularity University. And then uh, we began 20 professors. I'm one of those original 20 professors. Another one is David Orban. David Orban was also one of the founding faculty with me. And we have two of the first students here. One is David Roberts, that was also in the conference, very tall guy uh, with shaved, shaved hair because he was in the military for a long time. He was also at MIT. And Roman uh, Jamposki, if you met him, he, he was also one of my students in 2011. Anyway, so I work with the Millennium Project. We pop, um, also, that is how I know uh, John Suk Park. And also my co-author, David, David Wood, um, he leads the United Kingdom node. She leads the South Korean node. And I lead um, all of Latin America for the Millennium Project and Spain. So we published this fantastic book. Um, um, last year, a couple of years ago, where we talk about three scenarios about the future. In one of those scenarios, we have already artificial intelligence, immortality, and all of that. We also do regional studies, since this one is in Spanish, and you, Thomas, you can read the Spanish, so this is for you. Uh, we talk about four scenarios also for the year 2030 for Latin America. And I also, I coordinated one of those four scenarios and we talk about immortality. We are very proud because these reports have been handed out in, uh, at the United Nations and many other places. I presented this at the World Economic Forum, Davos, Switzerland. And we have four presidents recommending the book. One, Eduardo Frey from Chile. Um, the president, uh, Fernando Enrique Cardoso from Brazil, Enrique Peña Nieto from Mexico, and Leonel Fernandez from the Dominican Republic. Anyway, so that's what I do with the Millennium Project. Also, I'm in Humanity Plus with uh, Paul Spiegel. Paul Spiegel is one of the board members. I am the vice president, and Ben Gortzel, the organizer of this conference, he is the president, or the chairman, or chairperson of uh, Humanity Plus. Natasha Vitamur, that you also saw, she's our executive director. So we are all connected. Five years ago, my fantastic co-author, David Good, who is a personality, he created the first 
a smart operating system, uh, Symbian, for, uh, that was acquired by Nokia. He created Symbian. He's really a fantastic uh, guy, a mathematician. Uh, and I, we decided to write about immortality. So we published this book first in Spanish, actually. Yeah, this is Spanish, because hey, I'm very well connected in Spain, so we published with the biggest publishing house in Spain. It became a major bestseller in Spain and all over Latin America, from Mexico to Argentina. So we have been publishing in different languages. John Suk Park uh, coordinated everything in Korea. Then um, it came out in English, also a major bestseller with Springer Nature, so we are very happy. It is already in 12 languages and coming in 10 more languages by the end of the year. And I am very proud that it is even in Arabic, because Arabic is a very complicated language uh, because of the situation of the Arab world. So I presented the book last December in Dubai and in Riyadh, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So I never talked about religion. I only talked about uh, um, the scientific issues. Uh, the book is recommended, if you can see, uh, Michio Kaku, who is a very famous physicist, uh, Ray Kurzweil, Aubrey de Grey, George George, that should get the Nobel Prize in Medicine, hopefully. Um, but what I discovered is that in Arabic, don't quote me on this, uh, you can say death in 26 ways. Mm. Just like uh, for the Eskimos, you can say white or snow in 20 ways, well, death has 26 ways to, to say in Arabic. Uh, anyway, so the, 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 the publisher was thinking for a long time how to call the book. <laughs> uh, so anyway, at yeah, the We have something like six different ways to say death. So that we were, the printer was, you know, hesitating to use <laughs> this or that, and finally, you know. We uh, is it the same in North Korea as in South Korea? Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, now the book is being translated into Persian, Farsi, and also even Kurdish. I am very happy because these are Muslim countries and that they are interested in this to me is really incredible. So um, in, in terms of the book, uh, what you have if you are interested, um, please uh, do read it. I think it's a major bestseller in 12 languages and it's coming in more languages. The book has two parts, as you can read in the, sub in the subtitle, The Scientific Possibility of Physical Immortality and Its Moral Defense. So half of the book is about the science and the technology. Half of the book is about the ethical, moral, political, social, and economic issues of immortality. And we have a chapter about cryonics. I am also like Paul and Robin, uh, interested in cryonics. And I mentioned just before for the new people that tomorrow we have the fifth cryonics case in Spain. Sadly, I am not there, but we have a team of people who will coordinate the cryonics case. It's going to be a brain only. And we will send it to, to the facility in Zurich. It is 60,000 euros to, to have your brain in, a, in this new facility in Zurich, tomorrow bio. For the body, if it were the whole body, it would be 200,000 euros. Um, but anyway, so we are just doing the brain. So, uh, four chapters on science and technology, four chapters on ethical, political, uh, so, uh, societal, uh, economics issues, and one chapter on cryonics. So that's how the book is structured. So, uh, transhumanism. Um, I think um, most of you are familiar with transhumanism, right? I just like to define transhumanism quickly as as humanism from the Enlightenment period uh, two, three centuries ago with science and technology. Science and technology allow us to transcend human limitations. So transhumanism is transcending human limitations with science and technology. So Paul, maybe you have another definition as board member of Humanity Plus? As near as I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this should be fine, do you think? Yeah, transhumanism can be thought of as the next phase of human evolution. We have been a strictly biological species for, well, depending on how you find it, and since there's no such thing as really any other biological species that we know of, um, human beings have evolved from biological species going back to the earliest archaea, the earliest um, single-celled organisms. Um, and our biology has always been the foundation of our evolution, of our development. I don't care 
whether we're tree shrews running around 65 million years ago, hiding in caves, or whether we are Homo sapiens sapiens destroying the planet that we live on because it's more important to have a healthy economy than it is to have a healthy planet, so they say. Um, I don't believe that in case anybody is wondering, but that's it. Um, but we now have reached a point in our own technology where it is no longer necessary to be strictly biological beings in our evolution, um, especially considering the problems that we're having with our planet. Our evolution is rapidly becoming tied up with our own inventions, with technology. And transhumanism, in part, is the discipline of um, identifying, uh, clarifying, and managing this next transition in human evolution so that we can become more than just biological beings. I'm very familiar, but it was never a big thing for me. <laughs> I'm into the future. I'm into thinking about the future and understanding and forecasting and influencing. Transhumanism was this label about let's like change our nature. Some people are against that. We're for it. And it was sort of on that axis of but in some sense, many people, the main way to be for something is to find somebody they're against. And so the energy here is to be against the people who are against letting you change. And there are such people, I guess, but that, I never cared that much about it. <laughs> also about cryonics, because you were talking a long, long time. Both Ray Kurzweil and Mike Perry, who is at Alcor, they believe we should be able to reanimate people in the 2050s. That is in three decades. So we are very optimistic, of course, but I just want to, to mention that. But, but uh, that is plan B, you know, we are here towards immortality, which is plan A. Uh, so let me uh, bring that back, immortality. And I want to prove that this is possible and that we are very close. Uh, I am an engineer, I'm not a medical doctor, and I am not a biologist, but engineers, we solve problems, especially when we see something similar happening already. And immortality already exists in nature. There are small organisms that are biologically immortal. The immortal jellyfish is called immortal jellyfish because it is immortal. The hydras are also immortal, and some other animals um, can replicate themselves indefinitely. Also, we have cells that are biologically immortal. The germ cells for reproduction, also, they do not age. They are biologically immortal in the sense that they do not age. And also cancer. Cancer cells are mutant cells that stop aging. So uh, I find that incredible. Many cells discover how not to age, cancer cells. And cancer cells did not go to MIT. They don't even know how to read or write, but they discovered immortality. So if cancer cells discovered immortality without any education, without knowing how to read or write, we are going to discover immortality. So this is one of my major arguments. And people don't know this, even though we know that cancer cells are immortal since 1951. There was a very famous case of a patient called Henrietta Lacks, who was born in 1920. She died in 1951 at the age of 31 years. And her cells are alive. Her cancer cells are alive. They are called Hela because of Henrietta Lacks, Hela cells. And those cells are from, uh, she was born in 1920. So you could say those cells are 104 years old. And they, they are reproducing like teenagers. You know, even though they are centenarian cells, they reproduce like teenagers. So this is one of the proofs that immortality is possible because it already exists in nature. We have germ cells, cancer cells, small animals that are biologically immortal. But immortality is not that we are not going to die because if a, pia a piano drops on my head, I die. Or if the bus runs over me, I, I die. But what I believe is that we are going to stop aging and we are going to reverse aging, which is the other thing. The Nobel Prize in Medicine of the year 2012 was given to a Japanese scientist that I know personally, Shinya Yamanaka, uh, who discovered four genes that control aging and that you can reverse, you can modify those genes and become young again. He got the Nobel Prize for rejuvenating a cell, a cell. Another friend from MIT, he did his postdoc at MIT, now he's at Harvard, David Sinclair and his students. David Sinclair rejuvenated an organ, an organ. They rejuvenated an eye of a blind mice that was about 80 human years equivalent. 
The, the mouse was like two years, which is close to 80 human years, and the, the mice was blind. And through this gene therapy, he recovered back its vision, and he could see again. He, the eyes of the mice went from 80 years to 20 years. So we know we can reverse aging in cells and in organs. So this is being done with many animals now and uh, with different organs. They are beginning to work not only in eyes, but also on hearts. So we are going to begin rejuvenating that. And um, one more thing which is important, because I was in Riyadh to talk about my book, when um, the government of Saudi Arabia announced the biggest prize in human history, um, that is the $101 million for biological rejuvenation. And the goal is that patients between the ages of 65 and 80 this is the target. People between 65 and 80 have to be rejuvenated 10 years at least, between 10 and 20 years of rejuvenation by the year 2030. This is when the price ends. The price began last December, so basically seven years from uh, 2023 until 2030. 2030 is a very important year for Saudi Arabia. This is when the first part of Neom City, which is a linear city, will be opened. Also, when the World Fair will be held in Saudi Arabia. Actually, we were in Saudi Arabia when Saudi Arabia was awarded um, the, the World Fair for 2030. And this is when they begin with their new vision, post-petroleum. They, they want to move from petroleum into renewable energy and into longevity. So this is the biggest price in human history. It's really incredible. There are already hundreds of companies. Actually, some of the companies here uh, in the uh, longevity space are participating. Rejuve Bio, I don't know if you met some people from Rejuve Bio, they are participating in the $101 million prize. So I'm really excited that uh, even people here are interested in this. So the goal, I repeat, patients between 65 and 80, which you could say is our elderly people today, they should be rejuvenated between 10 and 20 years in three biological systems, which are very important for older people. One is the neurological system, because you don't want to have uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia. So neurological system. Sec second, immunological system, because we have almost no immunological system at age 80. And the third one is the mu muscular skeletal system, because we get sarcopenia, we lose muscle and our bones are very weak. So those are the three biological systems that have to uh, be rejuvenated according to the biomarkers we have for muscular skeletal system, immunological system, and neurological system. This will change everything, I'm convinced. Um, just one more thing about uh, Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil sent me the manuscript of his new book, which is called The Singularities Nearer nearer, which is the continuation of the singularities near of 20 years ago. And he ratifies two dates. He says that by 2029 to 2030, we will reach longevity escape velocity, which means that if we make it to 2030, we earn one year, we gain one year per year, we survive. And so basically we become immortal, but still aging, still aging until 2045, which is when we will have rejuvenation technologies for everybody um, and for free. I believe this is for free. I explain, if someone has a question, I explain this will be free, like the COVID vaccine. This will be paid by Social Security for free. But anyway, that, that, that is the comment. So Ray Kurzweil in his book, and I am in the acknowledgments of his book, so get the book. It's also, his book is almost as good as the death of death. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost, almost. Um, so he keeps those two dates, and, uh, and I'm really impressed because this day, uh, the two dates, uh, he has been talking about that since the 1990s. He has been talking about 2029 and 2045. So 2045 is for the singularity and immortality. As you know, the singularity is the time when a big artificial intelligence will have more power than all of human intelligence combined. That is in 2045. And then in 2029 to 2030, we will pass the Alan Turing test and we will reach longevity escape velocity. Anyway, so that is in Ray Kurzweil's coming up book. And those were my um, comments.
uh, in general that I wanted to give. I can talk about uh, how much it will cost and why this will be the biggest industry in the planet and uh, other things and open for uh, comments and questions. So, Koreans, like my parents, believe in rebirth. And she's, you know, she died, but she was keep telling me that, <laughs> you know, uh, indicating a plant saying that you may be this or <laughs> indicating another uh, chicken or <laughs> you may be this <laughs> to re reborn uh, all that so that um, Korean um, suicide rate is the highest at the moment among the uh, OECD nations and uh, some of those youngsters just kill themselves and why do they kill them? And they become uh, 14, you know, 15 years old, and they look to parents. Oh, not, this is not, <laughs> you know, that I like, you know, not the place that I, you know, want to live. So they kill themselves to reborn <laughs> to a better place, or to a better parents, to a better city. To be <laughs> what, uh, what guarantee do they have that they will get better parents? They just think. I don't really believe in it, but uh, some youngsters are now believing. I don't know. It's it's like a K drama. I think was the reason. There was a very famous K drama which covered the, these two people who are in love, kill themselves to live in to uh, reba, reborn to give a, a rebirth to another sort of era, another nation, another place. Are you saying this is particularly in Korea or just in, in Buddhist countries? Yes, a lot of Buddhists, they, okay. yeah, in yeah, I, even in China, but, uh, but China doesn't have K-drama, so K-drama <laughs> is affecting quite a lot to the youngsters, young, the young generation, so they might be the K-drama, but I'm not sure, you know, there's no research done by this, but I, there was about uh, two, three months ago, and that one young boy, actually, you know, 12, 13, killed themselves. And they didn't know actually why he killed himself. Uh, but uh, later we found, they found the uh, note saying that, you know, he wants to uh, be reborn in a better, you know, <laughs> richer or wealthier <laughs> family. Well, well you know, uh, Ray Kurzweil, he has been keeping the date. When he sent me the manuscript and he talks, in the book that comes in June, he talks that we will reach longevity, escape velocity by 2029, 20, 2030. Uh, I am myself a skeptical, you know, Robin, mm -hmm. and I believe in him, but that is only six years away. Yeah, that's way. Mm -hmm. but, but he's convinced, he says, this will happen. And, you know, I think he, to me, he was revindicated when I was in Saudi Arabia, because the Saudi Arabians, they plan to rejuvenate people 10 years by 2030. So it might be possible if it happens. Yes, another aspect of longevity that we should touch on, particularly given that our dear friend Randall Kuna is right here, is the concept of mind uploading. Um, it takes a bit of a stretch to accept that life does not require a, bi a biological substrate at all. But I'm personally convinced that if your consciousness endures, if your consciousness continues, so do you. Um, I've seen a lot of older people whose bodies are like, eh, not what they used to be. And in fact, the popularity of um, whole brain cryopreservation or whole head cryopreservation indicates that most people when they're 85 or 90 or 100 don't really want that old body around anymore. They just want their consciousness to persist. And so far, at least the brain is the only way we've got to carry that completely. But there is an entire branch of science dedicated to the concept that we can take our uh, consciousness and upload it into a non-biological substrate, um, which would basically allow you to um, go to sleep one night like you always do and wake up the next morning and realize that your back doesn't hurt and your head doesn't hurt. And, you know, why not? Because they don't exist anymore. They're somewhere else. They're medical waste, but you still exist. And this is both from a transhumanist standpoint, from a longevity standpoint, um, and just generally from a scientific standpoint, one of the more interesting and more exciting aspects of the field of what we're doing. I mean, ask yourselves, any of you, if you could wake up in a non-biological substrate, essentially live on the, the, on the web, um, you know, in the metaverse, would it matter to you? 
if you left your body behind, as long as your memories, your thoughts, your ability to move, to interact, to um, see the world, talk to friends, etc., were still intact, would you really need the body? Right now we do. It's the only thing we've got. But um, mind uploading is uh, interesting. So there is a difference, of course, because what we're talking about, if you talk about changing the substrate that you're in, so moving to another type of body, whether it's a virtual reality or some other kind of embodiment, it means that you are changing a number of things. So first of all, the environment you can live in and the resources you depend on can become quite different. For instance, you might live in the vacuum of space. Why not? Um, the other thing is that the way your brain works can be quite different. So if you're re-embodied biologically, if you're living longer, and you have AGI that operates at, say, the scale of nanoseconds, that's where it lives, that's where things happen, um, that's a world we don't inhabit right now. But if your brain can work at that speed, then you are in that same ecosystem of intelligences that, that those AGI operate in. Because I imagine right now the interaction with an AGI, if we try to make a contract with them where we say we want to have a relationship with you, with this artificial agent that is super smart, um, is difficult when it's the same thing as if we're trying to have a relationship with a tree. When it's waiting for us to make a decision or give us the, say the next thing, it's like waiting for a branch to grow. You know? So it's, it's important to imagine that we're not the pinnacle necessarily of what one can be, right? So I found in the conversation in the other room with Anders Sandberg, one thing that um, popped up to me is that the conversation, for example, about trying to set up a beneficial world where you have, say, a singleton, for example, in charge of everything, it still looked like there was a conversation about what would it be like if all of us humans, in a very Luddite kind of way, we're just all still the way we are right now, living the way we're doing, having the kinds of things going on that we normally do, going to parties and whatever the same way. Uh, it's all just happening the same way, and the only thing we're talking about is who controls the resources, are we still allowed to do the things we're doing, but no real conversation about how, how does it change humans? Is there drift in what we are? Um, is it even possible for humans to remain the same when you have these other intelligences out there moving forward, evolving quickly, is it even possible? Or is it more like a Cambrian explosion of new kinds of intelligence that you have to have? So I think where, where whole brain emulation and mind uploading fits in, it's not just this question of can you live longer. It's really a question of adaptation, adaptability, and just moving outwards into lots of possible different directions. So it addresses kind of a different question, a different, uh, different problem, or a, a bigger space of problems in a sense. Have, have seen this, the IBM punch cards. This was 1K, 1K, and we had to make little holes on this. And once you made holes, you could not change it. And so the first floppy disks were created. This was 1K, uh, 10 by 100, 1K, and the first generation of 8-inch big floppy disk was also 1K. In Spanish, it's called 1K. So I say 1K plus 1K makes 1KK. <laughs> 40 years ago, we had caca, and then it went from caca to 512 cacas to 1.4 mega, and now we have pen drives, like, uh, you know, her pen drives in Korea of one terabyte. So from caca to terabytes in 40 years. So in the next 20 years, we are going to call caca one terabyte. One terabyte will be caca. So, so this is moving very fast. So young people don't understand this whole technology. Uh, Yonsuk, you wanted to say something besides caca? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have a biological sort of, you know, uh, storage. Now, y y you can have, a, I don't know, caca plus how many. Oh, this one is to give it to you when we air that on the television or whatever. I'll send it to you. So the e your email, your name, your uh, you know position. You know, having um, researched executive functioning and the neuroscience of mindfulness. Uh, what I noticed, even in having been in Maastricht, which is a very good neuroscience research university, that there's no bridge between the professors and individuals researching plant medicine and their own experience of plant medicine, for example. So my question is that what is, con okay, <laughs> what is consciousness? Like what is consciousness from my lens coming from Northern Europe or the lens of the tribes in Colombia 
or the consciousness of generations of training of a maestro from the Putumayo jungle, from the Kofan tribe, or from the Quechua tribe, or from the Quechua lineage, because we take a very cognitive approach to what um, singularity or the metamorphosis of all of these um, transitions, not only transition, but transitions is. Um, there's a lot of these interesting stories, be them stories or just real happenings throughout the millennia of the rishis and um, saints and sages who have gone beyond mortality already, immortality already, whether they can change form or they can live for hundreds of years. I don't know. I'm a Western thinker and trained in science and business, so I can only rationalize, conceptualize, and imagine the way forward and how they might have achieved it. But the same for AGI. My standpoint is we never know whether it's positive or negative because we are here and where it will take us will be both positive and negative. But I'm wondering how do we pull in that cosmology of the Amazon and the cosmology of India and the cosmology of ancient China where the inquiry into Im immortality and transhumanism probably emerged from, not from Europe, because we are rational collectivist reductionists. Um, and how much of that can be used to support our decision-making now, or is it just non-phenomenal, non-scientific, non-statistically validated approaches of being or um, getting to that singularity state? make some comments. Uh, Ray Kurzweil published another book. His latest book actually is called um, How to Create a Mind. In that book, he talks about identity, consciousness, and all these issues. Uh, to me, in a way, they are kind of irrelevant. I want to be alive. So uh, my goal is to kill death before death kills me. So if I, I am alive, I will have my identity, my consciousness. But yeah, th those points are fundamental. I am not so much concerned, just like Robin said, you know, he's not concerned about certain things. Yeah, it doesn't worry me personally, but the, the, the issue is very important also in terms of religion. My book is called The Death of Death, and then that has to do a lot, a lot with religion, because the death of death implies the death of religion, because religion lives out of death. All religions tell you what happens when you die. Eastern religions, like Yonsuk, Park was explaining they believe on rebirth. You die, and if you are good, you go into a new birth of something higher. And if you are bad, you turn into a cockroach. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so or a stone, you know. Or a stone. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, 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 rebirth is in Eastern cultures, but in Western religions, Western religions, the Abrahamic religions all come from uh, Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, um, Islam. Uh, we believe on resurrection. So if you are good, you are resurrected on heaven. If you are bad, you are resurrected on hell. Again, uh, so this is a problem with religion because if we eliminate death, what is religion going to tell you about the future? So, so that, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, I try, depending on the public, not to cover or cover those issues. I think we are in a highly educated group of people. But again, even if we have rebirth or if we have resurrection, that can wait for me. I want to be alive in this way here and now because religions, they tell you later somewhere else. No, no, no. I like it here and now. Uh, I tell Jews and Christians, uh, let's do it the way like in the Bible. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, Moses lived 120 years. That is why the Jews tell you, may you live to 120. They say that during the birthday. When you have a birthday in the Jewish religion, here my friend is Jewish, uh, how do you say, may you live to 120 in Hebrew? Do you know? <laughs> Busted. No, I'm afraid I don't know. <laughs> anyway. the general uh, exhortation of Chaim just means to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, but, but Jews, they say, may you live to 120. So that's a good beginning. You know, I, I could be happy with 120, but I prefer Methuselah. Methuselah lived 969. So when Christians tell me, okay, no, but I want to meet Jesus Christ, the Lord, and all of that. Well, that's fine. But you can live like Moses first 120 years or Methuselah 969. So this is my answer to the very religious people, you know. Let's live first 969, and then we will talk. The good thing about being from where I am, most of the country is atheist. Like, it's like top three atheist country in the world. Estonia, yes, yes, but we are, whether it's bad or good, I don't know, it depends on the eyes of the beholder, but I believe it's more connected to nature and what is behind nature is not, it's formless, there's no form, and I think what we are trying to achieve, whether mind uploading or PCIs or different types of interventions, it leads to that formless state because the mind is going to be formless because uh, i want to raise an issue that i I've, i've seen in there connecting also to the conference beneficial ai beneficial transhumanism and so on and my 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 concern with this is like okay let's live longer then for what am i gonna party on a boat for like eternally what what is is it gonna like you know become Uh, what what do we expect that immortality will also lead to a wiser society that we will because they were talking about maturity like it should we should mature through AGI and mature but we don't know what mature even means I mean it's it's correlated with aging because you you become like weaker then you think further you get more experience and then you start learning the the along the the way when you have the the your back hurts then you learn something about life like you know so All these things. You'll learn anything when you're dead. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Guaranteed, you'll learn nothing when you're dead. This yeah, yeah, yeah. We know. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but, but that's not. Um, that, that's a, a practical way to stop thinking about it. it but, but it, it's not answering my question. My question is, how do the the immortality movement, transhumanist movement, foresee this uh, consciousness evolution through the the the, the technological means that biohacking or, or putting your brain in, in, in a device, uh, you know, works, that works. But then how can we go for this other more philosophical aim? Is, is there an approach? Is there a school? Is there, are there conflicts, debates? Because I'm a newcomer. I don't know how do you guys approach that question. Or you just want to be on a boat parting forever. Because I, I sometimes feel that. Well, first I talk about life expansion. So uh, we will live longer, but we will have um, more possibilities also. And I, I like to begin saying that this is optional because some people do tell me that they want to die. And I say, well, that's fine. You will die. <laughs> if, we, if you don't do anything, for sure you will die because there is no human that has been proven to have lived more than 122 years and eight months. That was a French woman, Jean Calment, that lived 122 years. The oldest living human in recorded history, because we never knew about Methuselah or even about Moses. <laughs> um, so, um, but this is an option. If you think that life is boring, well, you can die. You know, that, that, that has been the norm until now. In fact, I think we have made peace with death. We are living in a Stockholm syndrome because we had no escape from death. So we had to make peace. But I am not at peace. I'm at war, total war against death, because now for the first time, we are close to conquering death, to stopping aging, to reversing aging. So that is my goal. Depending if it is going to be boring, that is a second consequence. Right now, I want to kill death, because death kills 90% of the people in the advanced countries, aging, aging, aging. Um, there are other causes of death, like suicide, homicides, accidents, and some diseases, even COVID, AIDS, malaria. But in advanced countries, 90% of the people die of age-related diseases. We don't die from Russians or from the Palestinians or the Israelis or climate change or AIDS or pianos falling on the head. It's only 10%. 90% of the people die of age-related diseases. So that is the biggest enemy. So if you want to do something ethical and moral, you need to attack the biggest cause of suffering and death in the planet. 
which is aging. So that is my goal. And all the other things are consequences and we can deal with them once we are immortal. But first we need to be immortal. So um, Paul and then uh, Robin. We spoke earlier about the sort of religious objection to life extension and to um, immortality. So I want to meet Jesus. Okay, fine. That's a fine goal if that's your goal. But why are you in such a hurry? Um, Jesus will still be there. He's not going anywhere. <laughs> you know? And the next thing is when you do meet Jesus, uh, at least in my belief, one of the things he'll ask you if he takes the time is, what have you done with the life I gave you? And you'll say, well, nothing. I've just spent my entire life waiting to meet you, Mr. Jesus. <laughs> you didn't uh, spend your time helping people. You didn't spend your time making the world a better place. You didn't spend more of your time understanding the eternal nature of the Godhead. You say, uh, no, I was just waiting for you to come along. No, that's not right. Um, the longer you live, the more time you have to study the nature of God, to achieve enlightenment, which is pretty much everybody's goal, I think, who wants to die in an unenlightened state. Um, so if we can add another hundred years to our lives, the likelihood that the common man, shall we say, can achieve enlightenment becomes that much greater. You know, monks sit in cells silently for 50 years doing nothing but contemplating the Bible. Okay, that's fine. That may be how they receive enlightenment. Other people go to the jungle and drink ayahuasca or whatever, and that may be their way of achieving enlightenment. But what we have now, except for the occasional flash of light, takes time. And the more time we have, the more likely it is that we'll be able to achieve these goals. So Jesus is still going to be there when you finally die, if you finally die. I, I think that this is a lot about what you say, illumination. It's something that people, it, it's kind of like a, an um, implicit goal that everybody has here, I think, in the AGI, or it's quite common. Um, but, the, but, the, but there is equally likely that what you say, like the, the time that someone needs, um, I, I see that it's equally likely that people will also want to be the, the person that party for a thousand years, mm -hmm. you know, be that person and, and be recorded in history that was the first person to party a thousand years, you know? <laughs> so, like, uh, the, the, this, is, this, uh, this thing about goals and, and, and the, because we are, uh, uh, like, uh, intellectuals and so on, we sometimes, I think, forget that, that most of the people, you know, think in different ways. Um, but but that's all. I don't want to hijack there. I raised my hand because I just wanted to report on some forecasts that I found. Good. So uh, our world and data, for example, includes a United Nations World Population Prospect 2002 study, which estimated that life expectancy in the year 2100 averaged worldwide would be 82 years old. So they're clearly not expecting <laughs> Uh, great life extension by then. The United Nations is definitely on the conservative side. I found Metaculus, which is a more tech optimist f site, which has lots of forecasters. They have a question, when will a country reach longevity escape velocity, which is when, you know, lifespan on average increases a year per year, and which isn't the same as immortality, of course. Their median estimate for that is 2062 which is more optimistic than the United Nations. But I would be 100 years by then. <laughs> right. But, but anyway, I wanted to give some references as you know, forecasts that other people have made about this. Um, and so, um, and you know, resp with respect to your issue, I, you know, I just think modularity or breaking problems into parts is a key part of civilization success. We shouldn't try to, we shouldn't need to solve all problems to solve one problem. <laughs> So if your car breaks down, you don't say, I shouldn't fix the car until I figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And you just fix your car and then figure out what you can do with your life, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> this is a panel to discuss the topic. And that's a, it's, a, it's a perspective on the topic that I, I assume that. So problems. otherwise, let's just talk about the technology and how to make it better and, and who's going to bring money in the table. And that will be the only thing we should be doing if we care about what you say. But my, my questions are around, you know, we, we're talking a lot about you know, point A, where we are now, and point, you know, B, which is this, this vision for the future. But my question is about the, the achievement of the singularity when we have achieved that and we have a way to measure that as well. What practical things will then happen to get 
you know, with, with the advent of, of AGI and artificial uh, intelligence uh, or an agent being smart enough or smarter than humans, how do we get from a human level intelligence to all of these ideas? Um, yeah, I'll give you an answer. And my colleague, Paul, because he's also in the board of directors of the World Transhumanist Association, which we now call Humanity Plus, I will give you his answer. Um, yeah, this is very radical. The singularity is like, uh, you know, before Christ and after Christ, the world will be before the singularity and after the singularity. Um, and actually, I think the singularity represents the end of the human age, the end of everything we know, and the beginning of the post-human age. Transhumanists normally talk about three super capabilities, super longevity or immortality, super intelligence, and super well-being, those three super things. So we will have super intelligence because we will have artificial general intelligence. We will be connected to it. We will have super longevity. Basically, we will stop aging and uh, we will be super happy. So those three things. And uh, the jump will be incredible. Imagine like when we came from our ape monkey ancestors and our brain grew three times. And, uh, you know, a monkey cannot do any of this. Well, for that matter, humans couldn't do this 10,000 years ago. Now we can. So we still don't know the potential of humans. We still don't know it. But it, it keeps on increasing. So, um, But uh, the transformation from a monkey to a human, and then now from a human to a post-human, is going to be much more radical. So it is called the technological singularity because we cannot envision what humanity or civilization will be after the singularity. That's the whole idea of the singularity. Is um, There are several singularities. A mathematical singularity, for example, is divided by, by zero. It's not infinite, it's, it's unknown. Or um, physical singularity, which is like a black hole. What is there beyond a black hole? No one knows, really. So the technological singularity is this point when there will be super intelligent connected to humans. But anyway, that's my answer. So Paul, what is your answer uh, to his good question? So we talk about, uh, I'm looking at AI that we have now today. Mm -hmm. um, you could argue one of the most advanced systems is, is some kind of large language model mm -hmm. or, or something along those lines. And we're talking about an idea of general intelligence, an idea of a, an intelligence that can match ours and then surpass it. Hmm? And I guess for me, I am struggling to see the, the, the step, you know, the micro steps in between um, from the technology we have today and what it can do practically for us to what it might be able to do practically for us, let's say in 2029, 2030. What will we, how will we interface with this uh, AI system in such a way that we can get to these ideas? I see. Well, I think it's important to realize that the transformation that we anticipate will not spring full-blown from the mind of humanity. It will be a gradual and uh, presumably reasonably steady process. But it's not like the birth of Christ where you can look at one day and say, yes, this is, um, you know, this is the day it all happened. It's not going to be that way. You can't look at a tree uh, that starts off from a seed and it grows a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more. And you can say, yes, this was the day it became a tree. Even if you come back 30 years and you see that there's a tree there, you can't pinpoint when it became what it was growing to be. The process is always incremental and it's always slow. Now, when it comes to uh, increasing human lifespan, uh, remember, we're talking statistics here. We will someday find somebody that breaks Jean Calment's limit. And, um, you know, that's 122 years and 198 days or something like that. Call it 122 and a half years. Um, and then we'll say, okay, now we're going to have to move the numbers a little bit. Somebody else is going to have to hit 130. But humanity as a whole will not. It's going to be an average thing, and that will be a slow process. Um, so. So anyway, um, we need the to wrap up. Is in the book. <laughs> yes, and if you buy one now, you can get it signed by the authors, both of them. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much.